Hello everyone, it's Shane Kanto, your Wasteland Review, and welcome to Welcome to the Wasteland, my weekly show where I take a deep dive into a particular film. And this is the first not student feature-length film for John Carpenter, Assault on Precinct 13, and I'm joined here by co-editor and friend and writer at Sif Pop, Aaron. Aaron, thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, thanks for having me, man. Was this um, really Carpenter's, like, is this before Halloween? Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. The more you the, know. Yeah, because, like, basically, he had a short film that he did as a student film that I did with Rowan. Uh -huh. And then he had Dark Star, which is this really weird, quirky, uh, black comedy in space. Um, that's also like a workplace comedy on a spaceship. Uh -huh. um, I feel like Armando Iannucci watched it before he made Avenue Five and was <laughs> like, "There's some, there's some promise here." <laughs> and then you have Assault and Precinct Thirteen, which this feels like. This is where it's like, oh, Carpenter is here. Okay, yeah. But we'll be getting to that. But yeah. for those who haven't tuned into the show before, there's three segments. We start with coming attractions, then get to our feature of the uh, feature of the week, and then have some recommendations for you. Now, for January twentieth, this has been a bit of a surprising January for me. At least I'm like, wow, some of these movies are actually good. Um, and this week's a big week of expanding releases. So, like, Alice Darling, The Sun, and Women Talking, which I feel like are all films from the end of December that really aren't getting enough buzz on them. We're all going to be coming back. Is that too late for them? We'll find out. And then Missing's the big regular release coming out um, from the same creators of Searching. And then there's some other smaller releases, but including one that Aaron's going to talk about. But Aaron, what were the two films that stuck out to you? Uh, there's two of them. I couldn't tell you the title, but uh, one of them Not is Jesse some. Eisenberg's just uh, oh. directorial debut. Yes, When You Finish Saving the World. Yeah, uh, and then the other one is The 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 Son, the follow-up to uh, The Father by Fred Frederick Zoller. Yep. I... Um, I, I've seen both of them so far. The Sun's definitely emotional. I don't know how it handles mental health issues and stuff like that, but like, mm. I really think that Hugh Jackman should be getting more buzz for Best Actor, which okay. I know he got nominated at the Golden Globes. I don't know if we got a critic's choice. I think he's going to be one of those, like, could be that fifth spot at the mm. Oscars, we're going to have to see it could be Adam Sandler, it could be Tom Cruise, it could be even Will Smith for Emancipation if, you know, they liked him better at this point. <laughs> but, you know, I think that's at least worth it to see for the performances. And yeah, it's an intriguing thought of Jesse Eisenberg uh, doing writing and directing his debut starring Julianne Moore and Finn Wolfhard. So... Sure. I just look. I'm interested in the son because the father was such a great movie. I mean, I don't think I was as high as on it as everybody else was, but like, I'm interested. So I guess does that mean that Zoller's next film is going to be the the Holy Spirit? And like, I'm sure I'm the first person to make that joke ever, you know. But uh, and I'm in, I'm no, just apparently really it is curious. the idea because it is a trilogy. And it's like that's well, but is it is it going to be like the mother or the sister or like... no? I I think it is based off of the father, the son, and the Holy Spirit. I don't know if it's going to be like the spirit or not, but well, but it's also like it. You know, it may, maybe I just didn't see. Like maybe there is something that I didn't see, but like the father has like next to no like religious parallels. It's a it's about a father that's losing his memory and is like. Not really a good like he's a, he's a fine person right but he's like there's nothing necessarily like good about him yeah you know? and there's definitely nothing in the sun that flirts with any kind of faith or anything like that Got it. so yeah it's like it's like if there's no faith parallel you know it's not like Aronofsky did the movie or something you know um, anyway the you uh, mean the whole entire movie's an allegory <laughs> the uh, yeah no I'm just interested I really I really like the father um, and mm -hmm. I'm. 
sure for that reason i'm really interested in this on uh, i don't think i had ever i don't think i'd seen any of, the, of his other films but uh the eisenberg one i think is maybe a little bit more intriguing to me just because like here's a person who man what a career uh and, and i mean that in both ways for jesse eisenberg like he's had the highs and the lows and he's been on top of the world and at the bottom of the pit and he's worked with some of the best directors out there and he's worked with some pretty forgettable directors i mean he's uh, you know, social network being his big, um, yeah. you know, in terms of being on top of the world and, of course, working with David Fincher, but also like um, he's great in Zombieland. And so, uh, I mean, that's Ruben Fleischer. Like, that's he's a, I would say, on the more forgettable side. Um, mm-hmm. I like his movies, but I wouldn't call them good except for the, you know, Zombieland. Venom. Um, no, yeah, mm-hmm. Venom, Gangster Squad, I think he did. Um, oh, man. Uh, Zombieland 2 is fine. Um, 30 minutes or less is kind of fun for what it is, but that's about it. Uh, anyway, like he's worked with some really high time. I mean, Zack Snyder for the Justice League stuff, he's worked with some like really creative, like a wide variety of directors. And so it's just one of those things where I'm, I'm looking at Michael B. Jordan for Creed 3, right? Because like Michael B. Jordan's worked a lot with Ryan Coogler, but he's also worked with uh, well. Pro- again, probably not a good idea, but Josh Trank um, for the Fantastic Four. Chronicle was great. Chron- right, Chronicle was great. Um, so he's he worked with. Oh, that's right. He was. Yeah, they were they were both in that one too. All right, there we go. So let's save the experience for that and not from the Fantastic Four. But um, yeah. or, and or maybe maybe that was a good experience for him for um, you know the the lack like seeing the studio interference side of things. Well, um, like he worked with Denzel Washington on yeah one for Journal for Jordan. Yeah, that most people probably forgot exists at this point. Yeah, but. pretty much. But like G- Michael B. Jordan has worked with so many. I mean, even if you want to go back to the TV days of The Wire, like being on what is not unregularly called the greatest TV show of all time. Like mm-hmm. he's got the resume. Like I'm really interested to see like what experiences he pulls from other directors yeah. uh, into this story. So same for Eisenberg, except uh, you know it's like. Is he going to be more Fincher or is he going to be more Fleischer? And then this is produced by A24 too, and that's generally a good sign. All I'm going to say is because I did get a chance to see it, it is very, very Jesse Eisenberg. Oh, that's, like, I don't, that's not a good or a bad thing, though. Like <laughs> That's a little I, bit of both. I think it's going to depend on how you feel about Jesse Eisenberg's personality because both main characters in his screenplay feel like, oh, this is just Jesse Eisenberg. <laughs> but I'm going to let you all judge that. Um, my biggest coming attraction for me personally is Missing. Because I'm a huge fan of Searching with John Cho in it. And I don't think we've gotten to the point where the this particular way of storytelling has worn out its welcome. With the whole idea of like everything shot through a webcam and a phone and stuff like that. And... Storm Reed is great, and I think I did see this film, and the only thing I'm going to say is I'm glad that the trailers didn't give away even more than they did, Um, and there are, it does feel like the trailer's trying to trick you a little bit, Mm. so, which I think works for the film's benefit. Um, Studios (laughs) are going to have to start keeping out for that, because then they could get sued, (laughs) because... Open up that can of worms. Um, but I'm really looking forward to missing coming out and other people checking it out and hopefully people really enjoying it because my god, the audience I was with was l- like a live wire. Like there was so much energy in that theater with people watching that movie, people yelling at the screen and everything and really getting into it. It was a fun time. So but yeah. So there's some interesting things coming out. Maybe Missing is going to be another solid to good January release during a month where usually it's all just trash. So, but those are our coming attractions. Now, next up we have our feature of the week, which is Assault on Precinct 13, which this is an action thriller that came out in 1976. And... This is obviously from director John Carpenter and starring Austin Stoker, who is uh, who is some kind of police detective who's 
winds up coming into this precinct because, you know, they're in the middle of moving this precinct. So, you know, conveniently, all the phone lines are cut and shut off. The power's down. And because of unfortunate events, a whole gang starts invading this police station. And who's there to protect it? Police and criminals. So... Are they going to team up nicely and be able to defend this police station? But that just kind of sets the stage for Assault on Precinct 13, which was also remade um, with Lawrence Fishburne and Ethan Hawke in it, like 2007-ish, if I'm not mistaken. But Aaron, what were, what are some of your general thoughts on this particular one? Um, yeah, so I'd seen the original. Uh, no, sorry, not the, not the original. I've seen the remake. Um mm -hmm. I think it was closer to the like 2003 era. Um, I could be wrong, but um, I definitely saw it. Five, right oh, in between right us. In the middle. So. <laughs> uh, I was like, I think it's a little older than 2007 because I think I saw it in like nine or 10, which would have put me in like late middle school, early high school, which feels about right. Um, and I think it was just on Netflix one day and I was like, sure, like an assault on a police station sounds awesome. And um, I remember actually really not liking that movie. Mm -hmm. um, I don't remember a thing about it except they really didn't like it. And I think it was mostly the ending um, because if I recall, there's a very different ending. Um, I couldn't tell you. I just, <laughs> I believe uh, that's the case. And um, so I think that was also just me being like movies kind of had to be like one way. Like, mm -hmm. I didn't really, like, explore the thing. So I'm actually really interested in checking out the remake again. But, but um, I, oh, man, I think this is a really well-made film. Um, I think it's really engaging, um, but it just feels like there's a bunch of wasted potential still. So, I mean, ultimately, like, I'm still, like, in the liked it camp. Uh, like, I, I gave this, like, a three and a half out of five on Letterboxd. Um, but it just feels like a couple of tweaks and this could be a five, you know? I think, and it's an interesting thing that you say that because I feel like there's a lot of John Carpenter films that fall into that. Mm. And whether it's like budget or scope, there's just certain things about some of his films that some of them don't feel like they've reached their full potential. But mm -hmm. like he has really great ideas and he also really knows how to direct. And that's the thing. This film is a like a like a tight, just hour and 30 minute visceral action film. Like this does not pull punches. I feel like this film's very 70s. Like you could tell this came out in the mid-70s, because like there's a moment that triggers this whole entire thing with a poor girl getting mm. shot. And they do not pull any punches in the representation of that on the screen. And you're just like, oh, crap. Like, just hits you right in the gut. And then it all escalates from there. Literally hit you right in the gut. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, I that was, to me, like the standout scene of the movie. I thought that was just great. Uh, really expertly shot and plotted and... I knew where the film was going, but I had no idea that that was a thing. Because, um, again, if it was in the remake, I had no idea. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, yeah, I really... That that scene in particular was a standout. And I was, also, was almost just like, if the rest of the movie could be this quality, um, this could easily be a 5 out of 5. Yeah, and I know, like, I think probably for the first hour and 10 minutes, uh, probably like hour 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 10 minutes of this i'm like really honed in drilled in like this is visceral it's building 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 tension and then after a while it's kind of limited to what they're really going to be doing here and after a while it's either they're all going to die or the gang's going to die so like it has to get to some kind of payoff and, you know, it could get a little repetitive, but what I really appreciate is the filmmaking that Carpenter brings, because, like, there's what the first initial invasion sequence keeps, the edits keep getting quicker, and it keeps cutting, cutting, cutting between, at some point, there's only, like, four people defending this precinct, and it's, like, these quick cuts between all of them, and it just feels like the speed's picking up, the energy's picking up, and you feel like, oh, 
you're white knuckling a little bit and that kind of stuff is what makes us stand out as like an action film and then i do feel like because john carpenter always always has something to say because like mm-hmm. there there's not a single one of his films that just feels like it's just there um there's always some kind of undertones or pretty explicit things and i don't think I don't think at all that this was done by accident that like our main character is like a black man as a police officer and then having to deal with like the politics of like police officers and dealing with this precinct shutting down. I don't think it's an accident that this precinct being shut down is in a more economically at risk area and all those things are not done by accident and you can tell like it's laying those kinds of ideas in and i do think it's really interesting idea of him and napoleon wilson this like main criminal throughout the film appreciating each other for just being human beings and being there it's like hey we're stuck in this we're gonna try to get ourselves out of this protect this guy who was only well, how this all escalates, girl gets shot, father shoots a gang member, and then he runs in a police station, and then, well, now it's an invasion. And just trying to protect this man and protect themselves. And I feel like that kind of dynamic adds layers to the film. Uh, Yeah. Yeah, I think I'd agree with all that. Um, I think there's... Gosh, I've, I've been writing down things that I want to talk about. About, uh, based off of like what you've been saying, <laughs> yeah. I got my I got my little note sheet here. <laughs> um, I think I want to start off with, with Napoleon because yeah. he's easily the most interesting character in this movie, right? Yep. Yeah. And like to a certain point, I really want that kind of intrigue in a character like this, but to a certain point, like it almost feels like he just wasn't really written to be memorable, and that's just a shame. Um, because the actor's doing great work and I feel like it's he should be the most memorable I mean maybe the police officer maybe the main police officer should be the most memorable but either way like clearly Napoleon is the most interesting character here and I just feel like there's times where they want to be mysterious about his things but it almost just feels lazy because they're they're specific on some things and then they're vague on others so there's you know, three or four times that he's asked, why is your name Napoleon? And his response is like, I'll tell you, you know, when you're close to death. And then at the end, he's like, maybe in a couple of minutes, which was a fun callback. Um, and then there's the the whole, like, um, um, th- there's another one of the things, like, why why did you do it? Um, and, and he goes on to explain, like, well, a pre- when I first met a preacher, he told me that he sees death in me. And I just kind of lived by that ever since. I think that's a really interesting thing. But we kind of know what he did, and we, I almost wish that Napoleon was more like, um, oh, geez, uh, a more mysterious character. Like, maybe we never, like, actually even had a hint at his crimes, where we hear that preacher story, but we don't hear the lead-in being, why did you kill those six people? Yeah. Um, or we or we hear a news exposition that says something about, like, how there was people killed of multiple ethnicities and things like that. It's like... I kind of just want him to be vague because that makes him scarier if people are afraid to say what he did, you know? Yeah, and that's an interesting idea, too. And I feel like Carpenter has done characters like that better. Like, I like feel Mike like Mike Myers, right? Like, <laughs> at least in the well, original Halloween. That and, like, even, like, Snake Plissken. And I feel like that character in, like, Escape from New York works so well because Kurt Russell... True. And that's an that's an interesting thing that I was thinking about. Like, what if this did have like bigger actors in it? Would it make a difference? And I feel like depending on the actor, how they play that character, and there's nothing against what Stoker and Justin do as those two characters. No, I just think it's really interesting. Like, if uh, because like he kind of looks like Lee Van Cleef a little bit. Hello? And I'm wondering, like, what if Lee Van Cleef was in this? Mm-hmm. And, which which is funny, because he wound up being escaped from New York. Um, but, like, I don't know. It's interesting, because it is a lower-budget film, and these are not, like, big-name actors in it. But, you know, they're pulling their weight to a certain extent. It's just, 
were they limited by what they had to work with or could they have i appreciate the idea of like don't get stuck in a muddy middle ground with this character it's either you flesh him out or like you keep him mysterious and you're right they do kind of like keep hinting at us with certain things that it's just like do we really need to have this dragged out payoff well, and here and here's the thing too is we're supposed to believe that he is supposed to be like the equivalent of Jeffrey Dahmer or um Charles Manson or something like that like the worst of the worst mm -hmm. and then we find out that at least as far as i can tell he killed six people um seemingly meaningless right not premeditated or anything just killed six people but then we see the gang member that shoots the little girl and the ice cream truck driver and he he also left, like doesn't he like hurt or kill some people in the beginning of the movie too like in the opening sequence so it's like he's already killed as many people and presumably more yeah. than this napoleon guy so it's it's less of a threat when we know i mean look killing even one person is horrible let alone killing six but it's like when you're dealing with the people that this is dealing with it, yeah. it is it, it almost made me fear him less and i really want to fear this character and also i want to feel when that character actually chooses to make a turn to fight and it was just almost sort of like out of happenstance out of um like well, I either fight or I die. And but by the end, he's almost like genuinely fighting with this cop, and they have a good like pairing. And it's 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 just like there's other instances in the movie with this where it's just things kind of only happen when they need to happen, and there's not really any like explanation for it. Not sure Carpenter's first film, it's all that. But I I also noticed that with the um like the use of weapons, right? Because in the beginning, they're very precise, they're very tactical with silenced weapons. Uh, yeah. except when our main character walks out then nobody can hit him um <laughs> or when they're firing a million bullets into the police station right but then in the ending scene where they charge the narrow hallway not a single person has a gun they all have you know clubs and it's like wh where was the precision and the tactical and the like we've seen people use guns the whole time. like it was almost just one of those like the movie kind of does what it needs to do when it needs to do it and in that regard, like it, it pulls me out, you know, because mm. it's like, oh, all of a sudden, like these people, we were so fearful of Napoleon that we wouldn't take his chains off. We wouldn't let him out of his cell. You know, we we feared this guy so much. And then all of a sudden we um, we have he's he's a good guy now. Right. We, we trust him with a loaded weapon. <laughs> well, and I feel like. Most of the film sets him up to be, like, forget, like, his actual crimes, which honestly, this probably, I guess this would have worked better if they didn't mention his actual crimes. But, like, putting his actual crimes aside, he seems like he's built up to be much more of, like, an honorable criminal kind of thing. Like, uh, the whole thing at the beginning where, like, that one, like, the warden of the old jail, mm -hmm. like, flips him out of his chair and stuff like that, mm -hmm. and then he gets his comeuppance. Like, right uh -huh. off the bat, we're supposed to be, like, sympathizing for him. So, like, sure. that scene's done on purpose for us to do that. And then I think he turns so quickly to support Bishop because he saves his life twice. And he feels, like, indebted. And, like, he has that kind of honor code. It doesn't necessarily match up with, like, the reputation that he has or not is one thing. But I feel like the character that we get in, it's much more of, like, a... The, to use an interesting example of, like, the movie Con Air. Like, he's sure. supposed to be, I guess, based off of his crimes, he's supposed to be more of a John Malkovich. But honestly, he's more just a Nick Cage. Yeah, like, exactly. Kind of character. And that's what they're going with um, for most of the film is, like, he's supposed to be, like, he's only here because, like, he's a good man. He's just... Did some bad things. No, well, this guy killed six people. Uh, and, you know, it's interesting thinking about that. And it is, this definitely is one of those kinds of films where it's just like, you could poke a lot of holes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. At things. <laughs> and I feel like that's up to you as an audience member of like, do you want to sit there and like really dig in and think about this? Or just take this as a pretty impressive visceral real ride from start to finish and like you know it has its moments where it's like oh, does that make 100 percent sense does this make 100 percent sense probably not and i think one of the interesting things 
I I'm gonna enjoy doing this John Carpenter series is because like I just did Spielberg and Scorsese and Kubrick and the Coens. And for the most part, most of them are like 95% and above, like we did a really good job in these movies. And doing John Carpenter, like, there's gonna be some garbage. <laughs> and there's going to be some mediocre movies to talk about that are not quite as flawless and you know and you know John Carpenter's wheelhouse is really making these like genre flicks and trying to have some messaging in there making them a little bit deeper some of them work better than others but I think for a first substantial feature film like this not something that like you could tell like if you will, I don't know if you've ever seen Dark Star, but one of the aliens in it is literally a beach ball with feet taped on it. So like you you know what kind of movie you're watching. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like you could tell this one, even though it's a smaller film, actually has a budget. Yeah. And I think he does a really fine job with it. And I enjoy the ride. I think it's pretty thrilling. Yeah. Um yeah, I, <laughs> I agree. It's a pretty thrilling ride. I think one of the things that really lends to that is the score. I think the score is way ahead of its time. Yes. It's easily the best thing about the movie. Um, oh, it's, uh, I got so excited when the credits started playing. I just like, yes. It's one of those things that like is iconic. It's not as iconic as the uh, um, Halloween theme song, but I think it's because like you can walk around theming you know the do 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 like just singing that and get it stuck in your head but you know it for these long drawn out synthy noises to be like you can't really like do that you know same thing with like the old batman theme versus the dark knight you know mm -hmm. main score like it's kind of that difference where it's like both are great but one of them is catchy um anyway this this score is also great really helps um things i think one of the things kind of like you alluded to you alluded to like you can really poke holes in this thing i just i wish this movie was a little tighter um, but like we have this, the, the sheriff who is pretty, is confined to this precinct. Um, and, and all he's supposed to do is just watch it until, until the electricity goes out, essentially to make sure that it goes out. And then they're just going to abandon this building. Right. Yeah. So, and then in that same night, you ha they happen to have two emergencies that cross paths with each other. It's, I really wish it would have been, here, here's my ideal for the setup. Um, I still think you can have the the father the the father of the little girl thing play out exactly how it plays out, um, but for that to be completely accidental as well as the the prisoner stopping, I think you could easily have it to be where they're doing a very long prisoner transport and they want to just keep the prisoner held overnight so mm -hmm. that way they're not on a bus for like twenty hours or whatever, and they know that this precinct is closing. They know that there is no prisoners there. They know that they it will be guarded by policemen that night. Like you could easily say it would have been planned, right? Mm -hmm. And it could and you could work it into the plot. You know, we're stopping in Anderson, and then they stop in Anderson, and then the the grandfather comes, you know, comes about the same time, yeah. and and then the gang follows, and then the gang recognizes um uh what's his name the Napoleon. Napoleon, yes. I wanted to say like Whitey or whatever, but uh, I don't know why. Um, you could have the gang recognize Napoleon, maybe even like be followers of Napoleon, and then now their primary purpose is to break Napoleon out. Like nobody would have known that Napoleon is coming, but now because they were chasing this person, somebody saw Napoleon go in there. Now it's the gang's mission to bust him out. I think that's a really interesting cut concept and it kind of ties everything together more often you know where there was a planned high value prisoner coming in and then there just happened to be kind of a wrench in the system as opposed to here's this normal night and then two random things just kind of happen to happen and then they the, the gang doesn't care about napoleon the gang just wants specifically the old man dead but at yeah. this point everybody dead um I, I think there's just a like to me that seems like a really just seamless way to bring it all together and to make it a riveting film um i mentioned too i think this is really close to being like a five-star film i would love to see this movie take its time a little bit more um i think one easy way to do that is to take away all the guns in the film make the gang uh, more like the warriors where they're 
you know, more baseball bats and chains. Um, and instead of like, where the hell did they all get like silenced weapons and stuff like and that? And they're shooting <laughs> silenced pistols from sniper rifle range. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think I think that works a lot better. You know, you have you have them do melee, and then I think you just have them be more upfront. So, like, what I'm thinking in my head right now, and maybe this is just recency bias, but um, we, uh, m- me and a small group of guys meet together, and um, we decided that we were gonna we meet together every week, and we decided we're gonna start watching Fargo, um, starting with season two, since we had all seen season one together. Nice. And there's an excellent episode, maybe one of the best TV episodes of all time, in Fargo season two. That is a prison standoff mm-hmm. and it's filled with incredible performances and tension that will make your blood like cease, <laughs> stop moving because it's afraid to, to make your heart beat again. You know, um, it's, it's such a great episode because there's so much tension in what might happen. And I really think this film could do better. Like, taking that direction where the people in the precinct are aware there's a gang and even how about the gang saying all we want is the old man just send the old man out and we'll be good but because he's a police officer he can't do that and then you have the interior struggle they don't even know what the old man did they don't know why they want the old man and they make a mention of that towards the end of the film where they're like all this is for this and we don't know why anything about him and it's just i i think this film was absolutely the inspiration for that episode of Fargo, but that episode of Fargo became an all timer. And I think this is a really great film, but kind of want Noah Hawley to do is to do a remake. And that might be like my top 10 films of all time. You know, I feel like, and like, I can't speak to this cause I wasn't there making this film. I do feel like there was definitely budget constrictions. Sure. This. And I imagine like the extras, and that's why, like, you couldn't afford to have more, like, talent with speaking roles and stuff like that. Like, that's just, like, what's going on in my head. That's why this is, like, this is very stripped back sure. and how it is and why it's, like, a lot of the people get shot from off screen and stuff like that. And, you know... It saved a lot of its budget for the end. It, John wicked it. Like, mm-hmm. you can tell John Wick definitely saved up most of its budget for that one club scene. And then most of the rest of the movie doesn't have a big uh, climax and, like, big action sequences because, like, they didn't have any money left. And, like, that's, I feel like, one of my favorite Car- uh, Carpenter films is They Live. Mm-hmm. The third act of that movie is so rushed. And it's 100% because they did not have the budget to be able to make the movie that they really wanted to. And, you know, and it's a shame, but on some level, it's, to me, I feel like there's a charm to Carpenter films that they are small budgeted and very, like, kind of, like, B-movie kind of things, but really well made. Uh, But I feel like a lot of his films, there is, like, a, bigger better movie in there that could have been done and like i appreciate some of your ideas i do think the i do still think that if it did turn out where it's like they knew napoleon like this gang that would also feel convenient but i do yeah i do appreciate the idea of like hey just you know they were scheduled to make that stop yeah, makes well, sense. I mean, I just and feel I like think... it feels like everybody is talking about Napoleon on the TV, like even if they just recognized him. But you got to think yeah. that Napoleon influenced a lot of that guy. But yeah, you're right. Still convenienced. But yeah, there there definitely is a lot of convenience to make the story work. Um, the, like... the things you're kind of attributing it to like budget. And I, I really think it's sure could be budget for what they want to do. I, I feel like it's more just this is Carpenter's first film. And for a first look, um. Christopher Nolan is an excellent director, but I liked this more than following. Um, and Damien Chazelle is an excellent director, but I like this more than Guy and Madeline on Park Bench. So, like, this is an excellent first attempt. Um, but I just, I just feel like it's, 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 it's an amateur film make film from an amateur filmmaker um, mm-hmm. that gets a little bit of a budget, and it was also made in a time where people cared about these plot conveniences and, you know, the 
a lot of things less. Most of the reasons why people saw this particular film was because they wanted to see the big shootout at the end, you know, but, um, and, and I, I I'm also going to fully acknowledge, like, there's no way that, like, this, this has to be one of the most influential, like, action films of the last 50 years. Um, mm. Not only just by making a remake, but, like, again, that Fargo episode, like, has to be, like, the primary inspiration for this. Which, fun fact, this is kind of a loose remake itself. Of oh, yeah? Rio Bravo. With John. Oh, okay. All so, right. So, like... You and that's the thing, John Carpenter was a film student, so like you could tell, like, he definitely had his influences. Like, this is ba- this, this feels like a western, yeah, uh, thrown into a thrown into a police station. So, like, that's the thing, there's this kind of influences, and like, obviously, this was directly remade, like we were talking about in 2005. Mm-hmm. and on some level, every time you see a siege of a police station, there's probably some kind of influence to what this film put out there. Sure. Yeah. I, so I just, I see, I, I see a studio that just wanted to throw a bunch of money at a young kid and see what he would do, but they wanted a quick turnaround and they gave him that. And he gave him that. So sure. Budget constraints are going to go from us for some of it, but I think a lot of it's just nobody cared. Right. Um, I don't even care that much. I'm just saying, like, I really liked the movie, but it just uh, feels like there's an excellent film if Carpenter would have spent six more months on it, you know? It's a, it's one of those kinds of things where it's just like, you went in with what you got, did what you did, and I'm still really impressed by yeah. the final results. And, you know, next up is Halloween. <laughs> and... My brother will be joining for that episode because he's the whole entire reason why I'm doing Carpenter in the first place. So there you go. Let me but, know if you ever get to Halloween, the curse of Michael Myers. <laughs> I know well, it's not a Carpenter thing. film. <laughs> My brother, while I'm getting disappointed, is like, how many Halloween movies can I do? I'm like, he only directed one. Yeah. I'm like, uh, everything else was just milking. Yeah. He didn't even direct the second one. They just right. kept milking. He wrote it. He wrote the second one. Yeah, he's like... His exact words were, you know, I wish they kind of just stopped that for the first one, but I'm not going to complain about my royalty checks. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, let's be real here. He's making bank. So he's yeah. happy about that. Mm-hmm. And he's not ashamed to say it. So, and I appreciate that about him. <laughs> but time to wrap things up with some recommendations for all you folks. And Aaron, what would you like to recommend to everybody? Yeah, I've been trying to stay quiet on my like favorite films of the year um, just because I wanted to really kind of finalize my list and then get it all ready and then kind of unveil that to the world. And um, mm-hmm. I did that on my podcast, but I just like I tried to avoid talking about new releases, but um, that's all public now. So, um, man, I'm ready to talk about Babylon. Uh, <laughs> look, don't do not be surprised when this movie is is best picture nominated and don't be surprised when this movie actually gains some traction and becomes like one of the front runners. I still think like it, there's like that super upper tier of probably everything everywhere all at once. And, um, fable, fable men, and she's sure, seem Banshees. to be the ones that are getting a lot of attention and top gun, but is probably going to swing in there too. But I'm but I'm saying if Babylon is nominated, don't be surprised if Babylon starts joining those conversations with Banshees of Inishir and and and, all that. and look, Hollywood loves film about Hollywood, but you know what Hollywood doesn't like love films that criticize Hollywood. And um I look, my initial thing when I left away was seeing this is Chazelle's it's his love letter to cinema, right? I initially only saw that, but Mm -hmm. as many people online had pointed out, it is also a hate letter to old school Hollywood. It is, I I think the review that I saw best summarize it on Letterboxd where you're like, um, is where, where they were like, I'm not sure if this is a great movie or Damien Chazelle's suicide note. And it's like, that's a really good way to put it. Cause like, (laughs) man, it's so conflicting because there is, there is obviously appreciation for the craft and the product but there is some absolute criticism happening here with in terms of um we were talking earlier uh, uh, before we started recording but there's there's specifically uh, two two scenes that i think jump out to me 
Um, one of them is there's this party where there is uh, a, a Hollywood producer trying to like make a person more marketable. And it's like, she has to completely change her identity, completely change everything about her. And then she's looked at under a microscope from old white people. Like, and that's, it, it's such an uncomfortable scene to watch. And I really didn't like that scene in the film, but it is so important for what the film is trying to say and trying to do and trying to just be like, just let people be people. And there should like, there is a, there is a market for every person that wants to be an actor. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if, if the Seth Rogans can make it like, and look, I, love, I like Seth Rogen, right. But like Seth Rogan shouldn't be like as high of a net worth as he actually is. Right. Um, but he is because he's a really funny writer and uh an actor and all that and it's just anyway so there's so there's messages about that and then there's just messages about ho- like hollywood trying to exploit people um and there's specifically a scene with um sydney palmer who's this bl- this uh black trumpet player in in the film and it's the most to me it's the most devastating scene i've seen in a movie all year um and i'm really surprised people aren't talking about that um i think if he had more runtime in the film we would seriously be considering him in the best supporting actor wouldn't win in over you know kiwi kwan or Dom or um brendan gleason but seriously consider him for that spot so i love babylon margot robbie is my pick i really hope that she gets nominated and wins best actress of the year because she's awesome um brad pitt's great um i don't know that i would pick him over um some of the other nominees but gosh they're I even really like the lead. Um, Diego Calva, I think is his name. Mm-hmm. He's he's awesome. He's great. Uh, so <laughs> anyway, I just, um, I really love this film. And I think this is going to be one of those that as soon as it hits streaming, as soon as it becomes more accessible, as soon as people like take the time to sit down and watch a three-hour movie as opposed to going to see it in the theater, and not really know what they're getting in for. I think this is going to be one of those things that word of mouth hits quickly and spreads wide. And um, I think it's going to get more Oscar attention than people are thinking right now it's i feel like the the unfortunate dialogue around it is three plus hours and elephant pooping on people Mm -hmm. um and that's a shame but i think as of right now the only one that's really getting any kind of meaningful oscar buzz is probably what justin hurwitz for the and rightfully so too scored great and i would even not be mad to see damien chiselle get a directing domination I really, like, to be perfectly honest, outside of Hurwitz and maybe Margot Robbie, I don't think this is going to get a whole lot of attention. But we'll see. We'll have to wait for the actual nominations to come out. I I think this is going to be one of those films that um, because the Oscars has to do 10, I think it's going to sneak in there. But I was also talking with somebody, don't be surprised when when a bunch of people rewatch the top 10 and fall more in love with Babylon. Or just fall in love with it in general, um, and then they're and then they're going to vote it through. And again, maybe one of those things where um, let's let's say, for example, somebody's favorite movie of the year was Tar, and their second favorite movie of the year was Babylon. And for by some reason, Tar doesn't make get into the top ten, but Babylon does. I think this. I think I think Babylon, if it makes it in that top ten, kind of sneaks its way into that top tier conversation. And it's kind of one of those where you're like. It feels like a long shot until it's not. Kind of like Parasite, where you're like, it really feels like 1917 is going to win Parasite. Like, you know. We'll see. We'll find out. <laughs> we will. Yeah. Uh-huh. And this could now, all just be completely like Aaron's bad at predicting the future in three months, you know? <laughs> I do. Like, I really liked Babylon a lot, and it'll be a film that I'm going to buy, own, and we'll watch again. Yeah. To be honest, I liked it more than First Man. Um. So, like. Yeah. And I I was even talking to, like, Vinny, and he's like, oh, how's it compared to Whiplash and La La Land? And like I said, I feel like it's a bit stepped down, but I still really like it. And then he's like, ooh, ooh. And I'm like... Well, but Whiplash and La La Land are my three and four favorite movies of all time. Like, yeah, and you I'm know, like... It's I'm a not... step down to, like, not going to crack my top hundred, but my fourth favorite movie of last year, you know? So, like, I feel like the expectations for this were way too high for people, and I feel like that hurt it a lot, too. Now, for a film that had no expectations, and nobody (laughs) even heard of this, um, was Utama, which is the Bolivian 
a selection for international film. This is, there's very few films that have tackled climate change that I feel like have tackled it so organically as this little Bolivian film about like a farmer and his wife. Um, and this is a ridiculously beautiful film. And if the world was just, this would probably get a cinematography nomination. Um, but like, this is a beautiful little film. It's like an hour and 25 minutes. I think it's worth checking out. It's a very intimate, very moving drama that has a good message to say as well. And it'll hit you. Um, I always like to do as long as I have them and I haven't recorded one of these in a couple weeks because I was ahead. So like I've watched a lot. <laughs> That's a couple of weeks. I always like to do a new release, which that was my new release. My movie from my watch list was Texas Chainsaw Massacre, because I had never watched the original before. And boy, is its reputation warranted. It is a demented, nice. sick movie. <laughs> and really effective for like, it's like an hour, it's like barely an hour and a half, if that. It's like an hour and 20 minutes. And it is streamlined, and you're just on a thrill ride. And it, I feel like the production design and stuff like that and is really disturbing and works in its advantage. And then one of my films that I rewatched was 12 Angry Men, because I'm interviewing Heath about it tomorrow. Um, and every time I watch this movie, I feel like I have a deeper appreciation for it. And my, my God, the writing and the acting in this movie is just off the charts and it's no wonder this is considered one of the greatest films of all time and that henry fonda mm -hmm. so great and i love lee j cobb in it too uh and they're just you know i'm just gonna keep going list through all the actors so i'm just gonna stop now because <laughs> <laughs> to save this for tomorrow when i record with you but if you've never seen 12 angry men and also another side recommendation is william freakton's remake that was a tv movie in the late 90s if i'm not mistaken i really like that one too a lot and that has jack lemon and george c scott in it um, as the Henry Fonda and Lee J. Cobb characters, and especially as somebody, like, it has James Gandolfini in it, it has Tony Dan's in it, it has Grissom from CSI in it, Courtney B. Vance, it just has a ridiculous cast in it, too, so there's some recommendations. But that's a wrap here on Welcome to the Wasteland. Aaron, would you like to shamelessly plug anything before we wrap up? Sure. Uh, yeah, I'm doing the Hip Hop Writers Room podcast. It goes live every Wednesday. Shane appears on that every six months or so. He'll be on that in like two soon. weeks. Yeah. Right? Uh, to talk about uh, My Neighbor Totoro. We'll, uh, I also do SifPop.com stuff, so make sure to check out the website um, for re reviews, plenty of which Shane um, are, is responsible for, uh, including Utama, which he published, I think, today or yesterday. One of the two. Um, one of them. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so, and uh yeah, and uh, I'm currently, I'm about to end my reign there, but I'm currently the host of the Cinema Sins Behind the Sins podcast, and that'll, for, for the rest of the month, essentially. So, um, but yeah, plenty of plenty of places to find me. Twitter at Schweig Castle, letter at letterbox at Schweig Castle. There we go. And thank all of you out there for always tuning in and supporting your Wasteland Reviewer.